All right, guys, so I want to kind of go through um, starting off from the beginning and walk through, you know, how we got to this type of offense. You know, the gun tee offense is unique, and it's something that, you know, basically I was able to take what I think was the good from some things and mix it together and, and form this offensive system. So I want to kind of go through and talk about, you know, one, how did we arrive here, the theory behind it, and then talk about personnel. I think it's extremely important when you're evaluating personnel that you understand, you know, kind of what you're looking for and how you can adapt. You know, I wanted to create a system that was flexible, you know, a system that you don't have to throw out every year and, and we're going to go under center this year and then we're going to go spread this year. And we're going to go I formation or wishbone or whatever. I wanted to create a system, you know, that, that you can adjust year in, year out, but you're keeping the base the way it is. So that's kind of the goal of the whole gun T um, idea, you know, taking the best of the wing T, the best of the power spread and the best, of course, the spread world, putting them together and allowing you to be successful year in, year out uh, with an offensive structure and a system that's fluid and it's flexible, but it has base rules and it has answers, if then answers. So that's what I'm going to talk about on this uh, kind of introductory course. So uh, first thing I want to kind of I want to get to is how we got to the gun T. You know, to me, um, before I got to Southside Batesville, I was I'd coached in Alabama for a couple of years and been very blessed with a lot of talent. Uh, we had, you know, as a, as a young coach, sometimes you think it's you and you start to realize after you don't have that talent, maybe not so much you. So I had to figure out, OK, how am I going to be successful at a place where I don't always have the most talent? So 20, 2013, 2014. We moved, my wife and I moved, you know, kind of huge demographic change. We went from Montgomery, Alabama to Southside Batesville, Arkansas, and we're dealing with just a different type of athlete. Uh, so we, we didn't do very well. Combined two and 18, having a hard time, having an identity offensively. Um, you know, we were trying to trick people. I didn't really, I was a spread guy, so I didn't really know how to run the ball uh, other than inside zone, outside zone. It was just not something that we had a little bit of power, a little bit of gap scheme, and we had a little bit of not good, you know, and so we didn't have one thing we were great at to kind of hang our head on. Um, this is the first time I'd ever experienced not having a collegiate level player. You know, a lot of times when you coach in an urban area, that just kind of happens. You have them every year. I didn't have that. So I had to figure out a way to be good when you just didn't have a dominant player. Uh, we needed something different. We were seeing spread year in, year out. 10 personnel, 20 personnel, you know, everyone's kind of running what they see on TV and that's what is kind of hot. And so we wanted to be different. We wanted to have something that the team could not, you know, see every week and be prepared to stop. And so that's where a lot of the idea of coming up with a gun tee came from. Uh, we love the idea about these things from the spread look. We wanted to keep the RPO world. We had been really good at running RPOs. We had been really good at kind of getting two for ones with plays that had helped us in the spread world. And, and that was just kind of catching on uh, when we started into this. We wanted to keep that stuff. Uh, I thought it really blends very well with the wing T mindset. And, and we didn't see a lot of people doing that. We wanted to keep the screen game. You know, I think that the big thing a lot of coaches that come to me ask is how do we get the box lighter? Well, you've got to be able to throw the screen game or the quick pass game to get people out of the box. So we wanted to be able to keep that part from the spread world. And the reality is you throw a screen and one guy makes his block, you may have a play, you know, where if you run the ball, a lot more guys have to do their job. We wanted to be able to go no huddle. We want to be able to, be, to change the tempo. That doesn't mean always up tempo. It doesn't mean we're always just, you know, full gas. We wanted to have that ability to go high tempo, fast tempo, slow it down, check with me's. And of course, you're in just normal tempo, but with no huddle. We wanted to have very simple tags, but be able to get into any formation we could think of and any motion we could think of. And so while it becomes complicated, the idea is keep it simple for the athletes. You know, for a coach, once you kind of digest everything it can be a lot you don't have to run the full system every year or year one but for the kids they have simple words that talk to them and they know what that means the reality is in the spread world you're going to recruit better athletes under center wing t under center i under center whatever 
you're going to have a hard time getting the same athletes out as you would in the spread. And I'm right, wrong, or indifferent, and I'm not going to make an indictment on this generation of kids or whatever. It just, it is what it is. Tony Franklin passing concepts. I was a Tony Franklin guy back in the day. I also want to give a big nod to Noel Mazzoni, where a lot of the RPO ideas that I got came from. Um, those are guys that I really respected in the spread world and staying in the gun. And this flavor of offense allowed us to keep some stuff from them that I think is really good. But what we were not good at, when you're in the spread, is just general things you're probably not very good at if you're coming from a 10 personnel trying to learn how to get into a more multiple look. Our play action game was horrible. You know, we didn't really have one. It was, we're going to throw it, maybe run an RPO, maybe a screen, but not really much in that play action where you're creating those easy, move the pocket, easy, easy balls for the quarterback. Misdirection, again, unless you were good at RPO or could run zone read, there's not really a lot of misdirection. Uh, consistent running game. You know, with, with what we were in the spread, you put six in the box, well, now we're done. You know, or your five are better than my five, we're in trouble. And so we wanted to be able to move the ball, uh, running the ball consistently, no matter what front we might see. And, and in this offense, it is a run-based offense. So don't think that we're gun T, we're slinging another field. We can do that. We can throw the ball. And there are games we've thrown for more than we've run for. But the whole offense is predicated a lot like the wing T on the run game, setting up the passing game. Tight ends, you know, they're now becoming a thing, but they really weren't a thing before. And especially a tight end and a wing, you know, bringing a tight end H back, you know, a lot of spread guys maybe do a little bit of stuff with that, but not a lot. We wanted to make people defend a true tight end wing surface and spread. And I think that makes it really difficult to line up to. We want to be able to use slot receivers all over the field. We were we were blessed with at Southside a bunch of these 5'6", 5'10", 150, 160 pounders that kind of move a little bit, but you don't really, they're not great inside zone runners. So we could move these kids to running back. And then a couple of years later, we got those grinders, you know, those guys that are like guards at a lot of other schools we see. Well, they could play running back and we could keep most of the same offense in place. What I've yet to have, except for one year at Southside, is that true inside zone runner. Uh, Cersei, I had that, and I'll talk about that as we kind of go through the system and how we adjusted to it. But we want to go gap scheme. I think gap scheme running is a way to help your running backs. It's a way to help smaller linemen. It gives you the ability to simply just create space and not have to win everywhere up front. The benefits of the gun to you that we think, and there's more we hope, but keep the RPOs. I do think that helps you get that plus one in the run game, or it makes teams pay for getting their nose up in there in the running game. RPOs and play action are what we're going to go to to protect our running game. And we try to have an RPO for anyone on the backside and play action for anyone on the backside or the play side that's sticking their nose down in the run game. Screen and passing game is way cleaner in the gun. There's a lot less footwork stuff you got to teach. Under center wing tee is tough. You know, you got to teach all the footwork and you got to be super crisp. And the, and the gun is, is just so much more simple. Catch the ball, set your platform, throw the ball. You know, pretty easy. QB runs. You know, for us, a lot of years we have a QB who's a runner. Not every year, but when we do have that guy, then it's almost exactly the wing tee. And he becomes the fullback of the wing T offense. You can run belly either way. You can go empty. You can scheme up different things. If he's a thrower, you can set up the RPO game, the play action. So you have the ability to adjust the guy taking the snap. And then the comfort. You know, when you go out playground, I've got a third grade son now. I go out and watch them on the playground. Nobody's going up under center and, you know, fake, fake and rolling. Not that that's a bad thing, but kids don't grow up. That's not what they do. They go out there and they all throw it and they all catch it. So kids today, compared to 30 years ago kids, they're way better at throwing the ball and catching the ball. They're comfortable kind of in that world. They're not real comfortable in the kind of everybody condensed world. So keeping the gun allows that element to be there for those type of athletes. 
And then we have several guys we can match up. I don't have a lot of times where my X is better than your corner. Sometimes my A is better than your, your safety, but in our offense, we're able to create matchups where our running back can get matched up on your linebacker or our, our wing back, who's one of our better athletes, can get matched up on a linebacker or our slot receiver can get matched up on a safety. Those are the advantages we're looking to take in the passing game because usually we don't win a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. Uh, base alignment in the gun T is this. So you can kind of see we have a strong and a quick side, and we'll walk through that here in a little bit. We attach our Y and our B probably 95% of the time to our strong side. Quick side is quick tackle, quick guard. And we'll, we'll talk again about why we like that. Quarterback, and we've called them a T or an F, depending on you know, what flavor you want to call them, but you're running back. And then our receivers are usually going to go to the quick side. Now we have tags, just like everybody does. It can move guys different ways. But this is our base alignment and what we love about it is it forces the defense, if they play me in lined up like this, they're in trouble. You know, usually we get a defense that's playing split field defense, which means they're having to defend the strong side of our formation like a true wing T. Usually we're going to get, you know, kind of a cover two or man or whatever over there, a lot of guys up in the box. And then to the split side, they got to make a decision. Are they going to go two on two and give us some room out there to throw it? Or they're going to go three on two, like a traditional spread team would look. But what it does a lot of times is it forces the defense to play unbalanced. Now they're not playing 10 personnel or wing two. There's only one flexed out there. So you just kind of put a corner. Then you can play everything in the box. You're really forcing them to decide how they're going to play you strong and quick. And we start moving this formation to the boundary, away from the boundary. You start bringing guys in motion, start running oversets you really can stress what they're trying to do just personnel wise, because matching up to this formation is difficult. All right, guys, I, I know that you have all this contact information on there, but again, I'll, that's my cell number. So if you have questions, shoot me a text, shoot me an email, you can find me on social media, make sure you reach out to me. Here's some must haves. You go into this world and you decide, all right, well, this is what we want to do. What do we need to kind of, what do we got to have? Well, these are it. So if you're moving from the under center to the shotgun, these are things you need to think about. Number one is snaps. And I know this sounds very, very simple, but it's not. You know, I've had multiple line coaches. They want to play so-and-so on the at center because he's a great lineman, but he's not a good center. And, and a lot of times they've never developed that skill. So you, you've got to find that kid and that's going to be consistent or those kids multiple they can snap the ball because if you don't have that guy, you know, the shotgun's tough because a lot of it is meshing where the quarterback needs his eyes down the field. If you're going to run RPOs or play action or whatever, and your timing's already going to be a little slower in the gun, bad snaps are going to be very, very difficult. So that sounds simple, but find a guy who can snap the ball, multiple guys, hopefully, who can snap the ball. Don't just assume that's going to be an easy transition. And then with all our RPO reads again, you want that snap to be good. Number two, you need good quarterback play. The guy didn't have to be like a prototype quarterback. He could be a 5'8 dude who can run it. He can be a 6'4 kid who can sling it. He can be a great decision maker who's a pretty good athlete back there. It can be either one, you know, to me, but you got to have one of those two. You really cannot hide your quarterback if you're going to go gun in any flavor of gun. That guy's got to be pretty good. You know, otherwise he doesn't need to play quarterback. And so, you know, a lot of times you may in the wing T world put your running back as your best athlete. In this world, you may want to consider putting him at quarterback, okay, or at least having a package with him at quarterback, okay, unless he's a, a good, throws the ball really well. Decision making is priority number one for us, you know, because the, the better they make decisions, the more of the playbook you can put in. Where they struggle with different things, you got to take stuff out. You know, they struggle with the RPO world. You got to take that out. If they struggle with quick passing or vertical passing game, you got to take that out. So you've got to kind of decision making is going to dictate how much you can implement of the offense. But a runner or a passer is fine. I'm have a whole uh, whole course on playing to your QB later on. Again, some type of passing attack or QB run game. You know, you got to have one or the other. You know, preferably the passing attack 
But if you don't have that, then that quarterback's a great athlete and go empty and still strain the defense with a QB run game. But you got to figure out ways to get the numbers right. Otherwise, if you have no passing attack, your quarterback is not a threat to run, you're going to get man and everyone's going to be in the box, you know, and you might as well go under center at that point. Okay. This can be play action. This can be screen game. This can be drop back. This can be QB RPO stuff. This can be whatever fits your quarterback, but you got to have some kind of threat uh, to get the defense to balance up a little bit. All right. Personnel choices. So I mentioned already, we run a quick and strong side. We run uh, this because of a couple reasons. One, we rarely have five or six very quality offensive linemen. You know, there's been a couple of years I have, and we've been really, really good those years. And then there's been some years where we've had five or six guys that can play on the O-line, but they're very deficient in some kind of skill. Uh, for instance, you may have a very undersized kid that's just a gritty, hard-nosed kid. He's athletic, but, man, he's super undersized. You may have a kid who's gritty and tough and physical, and he's slow as molasses. Okay, well, by going strong and quick, we can find a place for that kid where we can hide his deficiencies and highlight his strengths. We also are able to install plays that go one way. So, for instance, buck runs strong. We have a word for quick buck to go quick. Some years we don't run quick buck. You know, so our guys know that cuts our verbiage down. We say red buck, and there we go. It goes strong. That's going to be right in red. Blue buck is going to go left. So it's really quick. Okay. This is easier to install plays, like I mentioned. And it allows you to take more time in your practice schedule of what that kid is going to do. For instance, we never ask our strong tackle, very rarely, unless he's a good athlete, to pull or reach. So he's going to spend more of his practice time getting really, really good at down blocking or double teaming. Okay, We, we ask our quick tackle to do multiple things. So this allows him to go with different groupings to work. We treat our offensive linemen as skill players. So it's not just you're the O-line, go with the O-line coach. Our guards work with our skill kids because they're blocking in space a lot. Our quick tackles work with our receivers a lot because they're out there in the screen game. You know, our strong tackle, tight end and wing work together as a unit because they're doing a whole lot of down blocking, okay, or base blocking. But we want to match the skill to the lineman. And going quick and strong has kind of allowed us to be better at that. This is not a you have to do this to run the gun T but it is something we have really enjoyed, okay? Here's how we pick our personnel. So strong tackle for us is usually a powerful but slower lineman. You can probably think of this kid. He's that 6'5 kid who's worked really hard, or maybe he's a 6'2 kid. He's worked really hard, and he's your slowest 40. He's just not a great athlete. You know, he's got big old ankles like this. He's never really going to be a spatial kid, but, man, he really is physical and tough and a good leader on your team. You know, that's where this guy goes. You know, in the past three years, now this past season, we actually did allow him to go downfield, but the previous actually four seasons for me, we never asked him to instantly release. Now, he might double the second level, but he's never going to just free release the second level. We're always going to scheme where he's blocking a defensive lineman and usually blocking down on a defensive lineman or cutting or gap hinging. So we're going to let him be good at the skills we need him to be and hide the ones he's not. Strong guard for us is generally going to be our nastiest lineman. This is a guy who needs to have a little bit of quickness. He's going to pull kick. He doesn't have to be great in space because he only wraps on a few concepts, but he does pull kick a lot, which means he's got to have that kind of grit to him. Generally kicking players out, we do ask him to base block at times. Uh, well, that's not a huge thing he does. We'll, we'll work to his skill set, uh, but pull kick is going to be big for him. Quick tackle is usually where we're going to put our most prototype kid. So that's our most, you look at our line, that guy's probably the most prototype lineman we have, meaning he's an athletic tackle or an overgrown tight end. We want this kid to be able to handle edge rushers, walk off space. We run our RPOs off of him. Our jet game is dependent on if he can reach. So a lot of stuff we do is going to be dependent on this guy. And we will adjust what we do, obviously, to him. But this is where we want to put an athletic lineman. Our quick guard is generally our best athlete on the line. He's the best at blocking in space. And, and size is secondary. You know, 
past couple of years, we've played a very undersized athlete here because probably 70% of the time he's blocking second level defenders. Some years, 90% of the time he's blocking second level defenders. So we really don't care how well he handles a big nose tackle because we're hopefully not going to put him in that position a lot. Okay. When your offense is working, he is the key. So you want him to be athletic because those second level blocks are the blocks that spring guys for big plays. A lot of times this kid might be a not quite athletic enough to play running back type kid. He could have been that fullback in elementary or junior high that just grew too big to play that spot now. Um, this guy is going to be a key to our offense. So he tells we consider him a skill kid, like a fullback. Center, got to be able to snap. Got to be able to snap. You know, this guy uh, will work with whatever he can do. If he's a good center and athletic and can move, that helps us a whole lot. We don't have to give him a lot of help. If he's can snap it and maybe get in the way a little bit, then we can kind of work with that because we can give double teams or create angles by play calling where we're only asking him to block back or with some help. You know, so to us, the snap's most important. We'd like him to go block and we can, we, we love that option, but it's not a necessity of this guy's got to be an animal because we're not going to really put him often one on one with guys unless he's blocking back. Now here's kind of an example of what we looked like at Southside a couple of years ago. We're in a blue formation, so we're strong left, okay, which means um, this is our strong side over here. All right, and you can kind of see big kids in 77. We're not going to be asking him to block down very much. You know, I don't, I don't think that would have been a good idea if we did, okay? Wing back, you can see number five is more of a traditional wing. Now I'm going to talk about kind of how that matters. So wing back to us, we'll adjust to him later on. But this is our strong side, and this is our quick side. So a little more athletic tackle, okay? More athletic guard, and we'll get to these other spots as we work through. All right, here's Cersei. So this, I went from a 4A school to a 6A school. My line got smaller and not as strong. Okay, and you can see I had about... I don't know, two, about three, four weeks to kind of get ready to play a season. So we even allowed our quick tackle here to get a two point because that's all he had known. And I, in three weeks, I was not going to be able to fix that. So quick tackle, more of a traditional quick tackle. You can see how small we are up here. The traditional center is actually pretty good for us. Strong guard. Our quick guard so small that the running back is about as big as him. Okay. Strong tackle, you can see not as great an athlete. And then we'll talk about tight end wing uh, as we move. But this is a red set, so strong is to the right, quick is to the left. All right, so personnel choices. So quarterbacks, I'll turn my little laser pointer off here, guys, sorry. All right, personnel choices are quarterback. Again, you can't hide him. I'm going to do a whole session on QBs. Yeah, I've run this system now for about six years. I have five different QBs, very different type of kids and we adjust to what they can do. But we want them to run the ball eight to 10 times a game. That doesn't mean design, run up the middle, and that could be pull it off an RPO, roll that off a of play action. They need to be willing to do that. They don't have to be just great athletes, but able to do that, okay? Uh, we've played fullback type kids at quarterback. We've played wide receiver type kids at quarterback. You know, they've gotta be an adequate passer. Um, this past season, we probably had the least passing ability quarterback, we're probably the best runner I've ever had. And we had a really good year. A couple of years before that, we had a much better passer, eh, okay at running. We had a good year with him. So we're going to adjust to what he does. But again, decision making is going to determine how much of the offense you can run. It's going to take stuff out or add stuff in. Okay. And I'm going to do a whole session on our quarterbacks, but I did want to kind of give a glimpse of what that looks like. So here is the quarterback that can run it all. He's a good thrower, good runner, and great decision maker. So he can now run the full complement of the offense, which is basically he can run the RPOs. He's willing to run it. He can throw it at the last minute. So that's kind of the prototype kids you want, a basketball kid, smart kid. And I'll get through all this stuff, how we teach it. It's not as complicated as you think, you know, but it is tougher. So that athlete, we could do everything we wanted to in our offense. Okay, uh, This is the same game with his eventual replacement, who, as you can tell, looks a little different. Okay, running the same play, and you see he's going to take it and hit it up in the middle and make a big play. So, again, more of an inside runner versus an outside runner. The RPO game can kind of adjust and change, 
uh, put down a clip of each quarterback running the same play. And again, like I mentioned, I'll have a, a full session on QBs. Go to Cersei, this is a traditional passer, you know, but are you willing to run the ball on third and four if they give it to us? Boom, he's willing to run it. You can see we had the option to throw it. He wasn't quite there yet, new to the system, but able to get me that first down. So we run the same type of stuff, but it's going to look different depending on your quarterback. And I'll talk about some adjustments as we go. All right. Then you can see this year's quarterback, great athlete, not much of a thrower. So now we're going to be able to do stuff with him, like QB run game with a little flavor on it. So we're going to bring stuff behind him to window dress it and then just let him run the ball, basically running QB runs. So we're able to adjust based off our quarterbacks each season. Okay. Uh, running backs, same deal with them. We're going to be able to adjust with them, but generally you want to put one of your better athletes here because it's easier to get the ball to a running back and hand it to them. You know, if you want to put him out in space and throw it to him, you can do that. This guy is going to be the easiest guy to call plays for because, you know, most of our strong side runs are meant for him. Okay. He needs to be able to block a little bit for jet game, QB run game, be willing. If he's a great athlete. We're going to get him matched up in the passing game and use him there. We have to put him out in the empty. And a perfect game plan, this guy's going to touch the ball 20 to 25 times in a game. So, again, you want to put a better athlete at that spot. The wing and the quarterback are probably the two positions that cause the most adjusting of the offense. So the wings are hard to find because H-backs, what are they good at? Is, this, is your H-back a great blocker? We had that this year. Uh, two years ago at Cersei, had a great athlete. He was willing to block, but that really wasn't his strength. And so he will cause you, this position will cause you to change and modify your offense the most, okay? Usually this guy's going to touch the ball five, six times a game. On counters, he may catch the ball. This past season for us, he was our second best player, so he got the ball a lot more than that. And at Cersei, he was a great jet runner, a great receiver, so he didn't get the ball as much, but he had more explosive plays. It's easy to get the ball to this player as well. Because in your offense, he's a very movable piece. And he will cause you to adjust what you do. We ran a lot of jet a couple of years ago with this athlete. And then this past season, he was not a jet runner. And so we kind of had to get rid of that. We ran jet with our A. And we, had, we ran counters. And we ran some Mustang set and brought him in the backfield. So there's ways to get the, the ball to this player. They just adjust off of your personnel. But usually, he's going to touch the ball a second most. So there's a normal wing back right here. Okay, and then here's at Cersei, where we have more of a receiver playing wing back. Now, we run some of our base plays, like this is counter. We're going to run our base plays with both of them. But 25 is going to be a better jet runner, receiver, than the guy we had uh, the past couple of years at Southside. And you kind of see here's 30 at Southside, where it's going to bring him to backfield and let him run that ball downhill. And that's more of what he could do. So we adjust to kind of what we have with our wing backs. But you can get them the ball, just it's going to look a little differently. Slot wide receiver. For us, our slot is generally, it could be a young running back like this past year. This kid was is probably going to be our running back next year, but he was 130 pounds as a sophomore. And so we were able to put him at slot. Maybe take some of the beating off of him. He would take it running back. We can still get the ball to him. We can get the ball to him in jet motion. Uh, we can get the ball to him running uh, buck sweep. We can get the ball running Trojan. We can get the ball to him in the screen game. So you can get the ball to him, but he is a little more dependent on your quarterback. Um, we get an empty a lot of times and bring him in motion. Generally, he's a, he's a read in the RPO game. Um, I think when I did this PowerPoint, our receiver had our, our player that had 800 yards receiving and 300 yards rushing. This year's kid, you can almost flop that. I think he had four or 500 yards rushing, and then he had uh, actually a little more yards receiving, probably that four or 500 yards receiving. He's a more balanced type athlete. Okay, here's an example of a couple of our slots. Here's more of a traditional receiver type slot. You know, we can throw the peak route to him. We can get the ball to him in the, in the RPO game. He can run different routes. So traditional guys, easy to get the ball to him. Okay, and then uh, this is what we had this year, more of a running back. So we're going to put him and run the jet game with him, get him the ball, or we can just hand it to him, try to let him make plays. Uh, they can, you know, it's, it's the same position. You're just calling different plays based off of you know, what that skilled kid can do. All right, wide receiver, so our X. 
if you got to hide a kid, this is where I'd recommend it. I'm not telling you to just put a scrub out there, but if, if that's what you got, you play the cards you dealt, this is probably where you're going to hide that kid. A lot of times for us, this is usually a young quarterback. So I think multiple years I've put our future quarterback out at X. You don't have to get the ball very much. He can, but it allows him to kind of gain that experience, understand coverages, understand defenses as in a game situation. So when he's called to play quarterback, he's much more prepared. If you got a really good one, he's going to get the ball five, eight, maybe 10 times a game. So he's not going to touch it very much, but if you got a deep threat. You can use that. If you've got a guy who can catch screens, make plays, of course you can, you can do that as well. But this guy's probably not going to touch the ball as much as your F, A, or B in this offense. Okay. All right, we are series-based offense as well. Okay, so series-based offense for us, we run three major series, and then we flavor them up. So what that means, and if you're not a series guy or know what that means, and I didn't know, and I'm still kind of learning, but basically a series to me means we're going to have the same backfield action. So a base run, and then you're going to have all these things that come off of that base run. To a defense, first, second, and a half look exactly the same. So for us, series number one, we run, we run Buck. Now we've added Trojan in, which I'll talk about in a later session. Buck and Trojan look the same. Running back crosses across the quarterback's face. We run the counter, which is the double handoff. We run the waggle, which is old school boot action. We run what we call Buck Pass, which is a strong side play action pass. We also run what we call Pops, which means you know, we're acting like we're blocking and we're going deep. So all of that's the same action. And then we a lot of times we'll pair our QB, we call it belly. Other guys will run QB trap with this or call it gut. But we're going to run a lot of our fake it and the quarterback's going to keep the ball up the middle type offense. Series number two is belly. Belly to us, we don't feel like we have to add all the extra flavors. So what we do with our belly game is a lot of times we'll pair that blocking scheme with our quick passing game. So we'll run all our RPOs off buck and belly. We'll run the same counters and insert passes and all that kind of stuff off of belly as well. Belly and buck are slightly different because buck quarterback will, uh, running back will cross the quarterback's face this way or belly, we turn it a 45. And I'm gonna go through both those series. The idea to me, series one and two, we're not having to add a bunch of extra play action off of this. It's the same stuff, okay? And by doing that, we're able to tag all this. So as you kind of delve deeper in this uh, system, you'll see by having few things, we can actually tag a lot and create a lot. And then we run our jet series, which basically is a motion series, usually with our wing, but we've run it before with our, our slot receiver, depending on what we've got. So we're going to run, obviously, jet game. We'll run quarterback, which is quick belly. So the quarterback fakes it and runs up the middle. We'll run a flavor of draw or Sally back to the strong side. And then we're going to pair that a lot of times with our trips passes. So we can run trips passes by lining up or we can motion into them because a lot of times that motion to a defense will trigger somebody and create openings in the trips passing game. Again, our goal on all of these is to RPO or give the quarterback as many options as he can handle. That's why that decision making is so important for him. So here's an example of kind of our buck series. So we run buck like everyone uh, does. We're in the guns, it's a little bit different, but there's our buck game. So off of buck, we're gonna have all these other plays we run, but buck is pretty simple for us. We can RPO this and I'm gonna get into all these when we get into the buck series. And we can also run our counter play action, all of that. So buck, buck is buck, you know, and I've, I've found that as you kind of move up, in coaching, this is at a 7A school. They don't know how to stop Buck Sweep. And they don't know how to stop the NFL or college either. All right. So the uh, this is belly. So that's Buck. And this is belly. It's a subtle difference. Okay. Still a strong side run. Okay. So Buck and belly. And then off of those, we're going to have our play action, our RPO game, everything else. I put a bunch of Cersei clips on here because we put this stuff in in about three weeks. You know, we're able to be, have some success with it. Helps that you got guys are in the ball off. It looks like that. Okay. All right. This is counter. So we have buck and we have belly, which is the strong side run. And then this is kind of our counter off of that or double handoff coming off of it. 
And we're going to basically run almost like a reverse if you're a spread guy or crisscross if you're a wing T guy. We just call it counter. And we're going to run that off of the same action that Buck has. Okay. Then we're going to start flavoring stuff up. So I don't want to get too deep in this rabbit hole because we're going to go there and we get to counter. We're going to run the same blocking scheme with counter and read guys, depending on what our quarterback can do, giving him multiple looks. So don't freak out yet. If you just saw that, you know, we're going to get to how that progresses to it, but that's still counter for us. All right. This is jet. So we're going to run our jet motion game, put an athlete, bring him in jet motion, come back and attack the quick side. Love that against three front teams. Scary teams that slant to the strong side. So that's jet. Okay. Off of jet, we're going to have other options. So off of jet, we're going to throw the ball. Let's bring our guy in motion, snap the ball, and read that same defender. And we're going to have our flood game, snag game, all that. We'll have a whole session on jet. But that's how I'm talking about series kind of getting built. Because to a defense, that look could be jet or it could be a pass. Okay. That's the goal of this entire offense is to go through and build off of series. So hopefully you've got a little bit of something of kind of the theory behind this. You know, to us, this offense is not meant to be run X, Y, or Z. We have it all in, and then we work with our personnel. I think a good offensive coordinator understands, hey, we need a system that can adapt to what we have. And that's what I've tried to build is a system that, hey, these are the things we're going to do. These are the non-negotiables. And then now we're going to have enough on your big menu that you can kind of cherry pick the things you want to use. So as you kind of delve through the system, hopefully you'll get to see a lot of those things.